Good morning. It's wonderful to be with all of you uh, this morning. For more than two centuries, people of faith have been at the forefront of movements for social transformation in the United States. Quakers, evangelicals, Unitarians worked together to end slavery. Spiritualists joined those folks in the long struggle for women's rights. Universalists, free thinkers, members of the Theosophical Society, Jews, Christian social gospelers, all worked to build the labor movement. The civil rights, anti-war and feminist movements of the 1960s and 70s blended the embodied spirituality of the black church, the ascetic disciplines of Mohandas Gandhi, and the magic of Wicca as they overturned ancient hierarchies of power. In today's faith-based community organizing projects, congregations that are black and Latino, Jewish and Muslim, Protestant and Catholic, work together to bring justice to our cities and metropolitan areas. And the Occupy movement of the past months has been the site of Christian and Unitarian Universalist worship services, of Buddhist meditation, of pagan rituals. This history is often neglected by mainstream media preoccupied with the exploits of the religious right, but it's not forgotten in the faith communities that are doing the hard work of prophetic change. Most of us know, at least dimly, that we stand on the shoulders of Martin Luther King Jr., of Dorothy Day, of the abolitionists. But we sometimes oversimplify the story of religious radicalism. Those of, those of us who've been inspired by the biblical prophets may imagine that anyone who takes the Bible seriously will think just like us, failing to notice that many religious conservatives are sincere in their own use of scripture. We often focus on the greatest hits, the heroic individuals, and the moments of triumph, neglecting the cloud of witnesses who've kept the fire burning during less hopeful times. Or we may assume that the religious left has always been separate from its secular counterpart, neglecting the ways activists have moved freely from the church to the labor union, from deep faith to radical skepticism, or vice versa. Today I will reflect on the religious dimension of American radicalism, drawing on the stories that I tell in my new book, Prophetic Encounters. What I have to say is shaped by my perspective as a historian, as a radical, and as a Unitarian Universalist. Before I begin, though, I should make one thing clear. I do not believe that one must be a radical in order to be a good Unitarian Universalist. <laughs> Our free faith has room for capitalists and socialists, for soldiers and for pacifists, for Democrats and Republicans and Greens and Libertarians, just as it has room for Christians and Jews and Buddhists and humanists. So if you don't endorse every cause that I might mention today, or if you think that it's better to work within the system than to engage in radical protest, you still belong here. <laughs> you may get the feeling that I want you to identify with the radical tradition, and I do. <laughs> but I would have you be a radical because radicalism is right, not because it has a privileged place within the covenantal communities of Unitarian Universalism. In prophetic, in prophetic encounters, I trace a tradition of religious social change that flows from a particular kind of revelation the revelation of encounter. When human beings meet one another deeply, glimpsing the divine image in our shared struggles for freedom and equality and community, prophetic power is unleashed. Even more than the prophetic words of scripture, prophetic encounters person to person are the wellspring of radical social change. For me, the story of American radicalism is the story of three sorts of prophetic encounters. Early in the 19th century, activists in the black churches and in the so-called working men's movement pioneered what I call the encounter of identity. This takes place when people who lack institutional authority 
discover their own power by coming together, sharing stories, finding commonalities, and claiming a new identity. You might call this consciousness raising. You might call it conversion. It is, it is and always has been the greatest source of radical power. Richard Allen and other black Methodists experienced this at St. George's Church in Philadelphia in the first decades of the 19th century. One day as they knelt in prayer, white deacons forced them up and told them to move into a segregated balcony. They walked out of the church instead. As they created their own congregations and their own denominations, these black Christians also claimed a new identity, African. All of their denominational names had the label African in them. Now the point of this was not separatist. The African Methodists knew they were also American. They'd been in North America as long as their white neighbors. They'd fought just as hard for freedom from Britain. But the African name signaled the common roots and deep kinship between Philadelphia's free blacks and the enslaved communities of the South. Soon they were speaking out against plans to send freed slaves back to Africa. We will never, they resolved, separate ourselves voluntarily from the slave population of this country. They are our brethren. This refusal to accept any false dichotomy between racial solidarity and full participation in American society inaugurated half a century of agitation against both slavery and racism. Around the same time, a working men's movement grew out of universalist congregations in Philadelphia, Quaker societies in Wilmington, Delaware, Methodist circles in Baltimore and elsewhere. Like their African counterparts, the working men claimed a new identity and a full share of America's democratic inheritance. Pioneering a class-based interpretation of America, working men gained power by reflecting together on what they called our real condition. When we look around us, my fellow workmen, thundered William Hayton, a shoemaker who was part of the Universalist congregation in Philadelphia. We behold men on every side enjoying wealth in all its luxuriant profusion, while we comparatively receive nothing but crumbs. The working men were the 99% of their own day. And out of these words grew the first class conscious political party in the world. The working men's party briefly revolutionized politics in Philadelphia, New York, and other cities. Some of their demands, such as for pre -pub free public schools, were quickly accepted by the big parties. But both they and the African Methodists had limited power uh, because of their limits of numbers. A second sort of prophetic encounter was needed to extend radical power from communities that were empowering themselves to more privileged individuals and communities. This was the personal encounter that occurred when the privileged met the newly empowered face to face. That's what happened when Frederick Douglass met white editor William Lloyd Garrison in Nantucket. Hearing Douglas tell the story of his fight for freedom, Garrison reported that he'd never seen the godlike nature of slavery's victims so clearly. Think of that, the godlike nature. For Garrison, meeting Douglas was like meeting God. Countless others also caught fire when they heard Douglas speak. The same thing happened when Angelina Grimke and Abby Kelly, both white women, began making speeches on behalf of enslaved persons. Back then, it was taboo for women to speak publicly to mixed audiences. By breaking that taboo, Grimke and Kelly forced men to confront their full humanity. Now, these personal encounters could work because practices of individual testimony were part of the evangelical Protestant culture of the time. You didn't have to be an evangelical to be shaped by that culture and see the power of personal testimony. So out of this emerged a radical theology centered on the idea that every person is a mirror of the divine. 
Almost a century later, Dorothy Day testified to a third sort of prophetic encounter when she described the sort of idealism that led her both to socialism and to Roman Catholicism. Socialists thought of the poor and oppressed as collectively the new messiah. And that idea inspired Day to go to the places where the poor were. And in the cities where she lived, those places were Roman Catholic parishes. After converting, she created a new movement, the Catholic worker, that aspired to mobilize the Catholic poor to build a new society within the shell of the old. The slogan, Catholic workers borrowed from the industrial workers of the world. Day's concern for the whole community of the poor was a product of the mass society brought about by urbanization and industrialization. In order to meet poor communities, radicals created settlement houses. They embraced a theology that saw sin and salvation in social terms. So that the building of a new society here on earth was identified with the Christian promise of a kingdom of God. Some even aspired to build a commonwealth rather than a kingdom of God. Like the personal encounters of the abolitionists, these collective encounters ultimately derived their power from the encounter of identity. The workers that Day longed to meet were already empowering themselves in trade unions, in the IWW, and in the Socialist Party. Professional class allies went to settlement houses to catch some of that spirit. Yet the power of identity encounters remained invisible to many middle class Americans until the middle of the 20th century. Then, conveniently, television came along. Just in time for the Montgomery bus boycott and the student sit-ins and the freedom rides suddenly everyone could see the kind of power that was unleashed when black preachers, students, and sharecroppers affirmed their own dignity and defied Jim Crow. Soon everyone was catching fire and everyone was wanting to get some of that same power. For civil rights activists, identity encounters took place in mass meetings that adapted black church preaching and hymns to the cause of freedom. For college students, a sense of generationally shared identity made possible resistance to the draft. For feminists, consciousness-raising groups evolved into new forms of religious community, among them the covens and circles of the goddess movement. Encounters of identity also gave birth to new Christian and Jewish theologies of liberation, which ascribed special authority to communities of the oppressed. These three sorts of encounters, each linked to the others, are what make American radicalism a single continuous tradition and not just a collection of self-contained movements restricted to particular times or places. In every generation, young and old activists have built alliances and drawn inspiration, religious convictions and strategies from one another and from those who've gone before. American radicalism, in other words, is a family tradition. And like most families, it's not always harmonious. Many of radicalism's fights have had to do with religion. Free thinkers and Marxists draw spiritual power from encounters, but they see mainstream religion as part of the problem needing to be overcome. Radical evangelicals and Roman Catholics see religious institutions as a source of strength. This sibling rivalry flows from a shared experience of prophetic encounters. All these folks, the Marxists and the Catholics alike, have seen the divine in one another. They wouldn't necessarily use that language, but they've seen a spiritual spark in one another. And for this reason, their experiences as radicals are very much like religious experiences. In radical movements, as in church, people connect their daily routines to a more transcendent vision, whether that vision be of heaven or of a changed society here on earth. Both religion and radicalism offer individuals powerful new identities 
as children of God or as class conscious workers or as the 99%. In order to extend power, radicals build social reform societies and utopian communities that look a lot like churches. Radicals come together to sing hymns and hear sermons, especially in the 19th century, often gathering on Sunday morning to sing songs about the dangers of mainstream religion. <laughs> they articulate their defining beliefs and excommunicate those who dissent. Their marches are like pilgrimages and their line crossing in civil disobedience like a ritual of initiation. More mainstream politics with its horse trading and pragmatic compromises may not look much like a religion, but radicalism always burns with divine fire. And so, like other pairs of siblings, conventional religion and radicalism do burn one another. While radicals seek to live in relation to a better world that might exist here on earth in the future, many people of faith orient their lives to realities beyond this world. While radicals achieve empowered identities through interpersonal encounters, most religions offer a new identity through encounter with spiritual beings. Some radicals, like Dorothy Day, find their religious and radical commitments to be mutually reinforcing. Others come to see their cause as the true church. By this time, it should be obvious to some of you how this book is shaped by my identity as a Unitarian Universalist. As you use, we're pretty comfortable living in that border zone between religion and secularism or between religion and irreligion. Since the left has always been that sort of a border zone, it shouldn't surprise us that there's a lot of overlap between Unitarian Universalism and the left though we should never forget the range of, political and of politics and ideologies in our communities. So since finishing the book, I've spent some time thinking more concretely about the ways Unitarians and Universalists remember our place in the radical tradition. I've come to believe that we have not one but two strands of tradition to draw on. The first associated with early Unitarianism, the second with early Universalism. The first path, typically taken by early Unitarians, centers on ethics. It's the story of people who ask, how should we use the power that we have? The path more typically taken by early Universalists centers on empowerment. It's the story of people who ask, how can we get more power? The ethics question comes naturally to highly educated ministers serving prosperous congregations. It's the question that led Unitarian Joseph Tuckerman to sponsor a ministry at large in Boston's poor neighborhoods in the 1820s. It's the question that led white people into the abolitionist movement and into the NAACP, that led men into feminist activism and middle class professionals into socialism. It's a story of personal and collective encounters across the boundaries of class and privilege. And if you trace any of those stories through, U through United States history, you're going to find one heck of a lot of Unitarians. The empowerment question, by contrast, comes to people who feel excluded from powerful institutions, including powerful religious institutions. These folks' style of radicalism can be perceived as secular or irreligious, but often it reflects a kind of religion that has less to do with established institutional power and more to do with the self-empowerment of individuals and communities. A name for this sort of religion is magic. <laughs> now magic, as I understand it, is not necessarily supernatural or anti-scientific. Contemporary pagans define magic as changing consciousness at will, as practices that align our consciousness with the deep structures of the cosmos. In this sense, what I call the encounter of identity, oppressed people finding power by sharing their stories, is a form of magic, just as personal encounters and collective encounters are expressions of that ethics. Now, early Universalists loved magic. Thousands of them dabbled in alchemy, in mesmerism, in homeopathic medicine, all sorts of stuff. And these same folks 
were the ones who built the labor movement uh, in the United States beginning of the early 19th century. Now this isn't because universalists were especially oppressed. They weren't as privileged as early Unitarians, but they were kind of in the middle of the early American class system. But universalists were drawn to magic because they were excluded from the established religious power of the state-sponsored churches. In the great struggle over whether to retain uh, state support for religion in Massachusetts, Universalists were on one side and Unitarians were decidedly on the other side. Now here in Connecticut the story was different, but I'm going to save that for coffee hour. <laughs> As a consequence, Unitarian Universalists today have the great good fortune to have inherited both a Unitarian tradition emphasizing the ethical use of power and a Universalist tradition emphasizing magical empowerment. Now what we see today is the rebirth of the magical style of activism that characterized universalism in its 19th century heyday. Consider this. Universalism shrank and Unitarianism grew in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. Economic boom years when Americans streamed through universities into the middle class. And this congregation was born out of that boom. It was a time for ethics and Unitarianism delivered, forming a generation of mostly white activists who reached out to their black brothers and sisters in the South and who helped end the most unethical war in U.S. history. But our time is a time for empowerment. Median income is at 1997 levels and going down. 50 million Americans are poor and each day more of those poor Americans are in our Unitarian Universalist congregations. Unemployment and underwater mortgages threaten everyone's future, whether our background is professional or working class. Our fields are poisoned with pesticide. Our air is poisoned with methane and carbon dioxide. Our federal budget is poisoned with weapons and prisons. And our politics are poisoned by Wall Street cash. In times like this, we need to remember that empowerment as well as ethics is religious work. Ethics without empowerment can't speak to the unemployed. It can't speak to gay and lesbian youth who have been taught that the deepest parts of their identity are sinful. It can't speak to teenage moms who've been abandoned, who believe it's their fault they've been abandoned by their boyfriends, by their schools, and by the welfare system. Ethics without empowerment can't speak to immigrants who've been told that they're welcome to clean our toilets and pick our tomatoes, but not to share in building our future. Ethics without empowerment can't speak to an entire generation of Americans who have no reason to believe that their lives will be materially better than their parents, the first generation in this country that has had this experience. But magic is afoot today. It's afoot among people who plant gardens in the vacant lots of Oakland and Detroit, it's afoot among the evangelicals of all races who are turning to Christian universalism because they yearn for the unconditional love of God. It's afoot among the undocumented immigrant children and youth who are coming out of the closet and claiming their seats at the schoolhouse and at the university. And magic is what's afoot among all the people coming together in the Occupy movement. By retaking public spaces, Occupiers are changing their own consciousness and that of America. They're creating new spaces for unemployed college graduates, for homeless persons, and for veteran activists to reimagine society together. Together they're learning that a community can speak more loudly than a microphone. This is a moment for magic and that's why in this moment so many Unitarian Universalists are putting up tents to join occupiers, putting on yellow standing on the side of love t-shirts to join immigrants in Phoenix or in our own communities. Tents and yellow shirts are not about ethics. They aren't really designed for privileged people who feel powerful and want to share our power with the downtrodden. If we felt so powerful, we wouldn't need a tent or a yellow shirt. Tents and yellow shirts are magical things that we need because we too have felt cast out. 
With them, we hope to cast a circle that's broad enough and big enough to join us to all the beautiful people who are empowering themselves today in every corner of the world. That magic has been going on for hundreds of years, and this is our time to step more fully into the circle. May it be so.